Welcome again to our Sunday morning service. We have come to the uh, preaching time, and uh, we're glad that you are joined us, have joined us. Uh, happy Independence Day on a great uh, July the 4th. I uh, always love this day. I have my, my American tie on. Earlier in Sunday school, I said I had my American flag on, but my tie is in the form of, a, of the American flag, and I love this day. I love this country. I am so glad uh, God brought me here, and, uh, but uh, I lament also the fact that I see uh, that the left is destroying uh, this gem that God has given us. Uh, I come from Canada, and I saw how socialism destroyed the great country of Canada, and I see it uh, happening here in the United States. That was free, by the way, uh, but I do love this country, don't get me wrong. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to go through uh, quite a few verses this morning. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6. And this morning I want to preach on the sin of pride. The sin of pride. And uh, there is one book that has a lot to teach regarding pride, and that's Proverbs. So Proverbs chapter 6, we're going to read from verse 16 down to... Uh, let's read, uh, uh, yes, chapter 6. What did I say? Chapter 6 or 16? 6. 6, okay, good. Sometimes my mind is slowing down as I'm getting older in years, but that's okay. Uh, I tell my kids that it's leaking out. Well, white hair is a sign that your brain is leaking out. But, uh, verse 16. These things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So these are the things that God hates, and which one is number one on the list? A proud look. So now turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 16. We're going to read the first part of the verse. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. And it says here, uh, Everyone that is proud in heart is what? Read that, look at that word carefully. An abomination to the Lord. God hates those who have pride in their heart. And jump down to verse 18 of the same chapter. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The end of pride is destruction. Now we go again. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 4. Another verse. Uh, a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Three things. If, you, if you're conceited, if you have pride in your heart, and if you're, if you're a wicked who's working, uh, no matter what you're doing, as long as you're wicked, God says all that is sin. Now we turn to Job. So we go backwards. We're going to go to Job chapter 41. And the book of Job is one of those books that gives you great insight uh, in the dealings of Satan, how Satan operates who he is, what he is like. So in Job chapter 41, verse 33 and 34, the Bible tells us in this whole entire chapter, of, uh, not the entire chapter, but this chapter has a lot to say about the devil. In verse 33 and 34, Job tells us, uh, God tells us in the book of Job, upon the earth there is not like, not his like, who is made without fear. Verse 34, he beholdeth, all high things, and this is what I want you to focus your attention on, he is a king over all the children of pride. God tells us that Satan is king over those who are proud. Now I want you to turn now to Isaiah, chapter 41. We're trying to give you a picture of pride over here. And uh, if when we talk about pride, we cannot help, or not only help, but I believe we have to look at the devil, because he is the king over all the children of pride. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, God gives us uh, the reason why Satan or Lucifer fell. Isaiah chapter 14, we begin in verse uh, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, let me ask you this. Does everybody know who Lucifer is? Satan. Pretty much. Uh, even my daughter knows who is Lucifer? Satan. Satan. Everybody in English society in the Western world 
knows that Lucifer is Satan. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. So God tells us what happened to this, to this creature, this magnificent creature, uh, the greatest of all of God's creatures. Because he said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, who are these stars of God? Well, they are equivalent to the sons of God. You can find that in the book of Job, that reference. When all the stars of God, with all the sons of God sang with joy. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And then God says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Now, I'm, before I give you my last passage, which is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, I know I've given you a lot of verses, hopefully you have marked them down. Uh, it's in giving you a composite picture of pride uh, through the scriptures. And as you're turning in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, I want to I keep saying this, and I, I say this because it needs to be said. Uh, if your Bible says anything but Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12, get rid of it. Just throw it out. Uh, do you know what the unpardonable sin in the Bible is? The unpardonable sin in the Bible? Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. It is when the scribes and Pharisees ascribe the power of Christ to Satan. The Jewish leaders accused Jesus of performing, of performing miracles through the power of Satan. And God said these people will never be forgiven. Do you think God takes it lightly when uh, they have ascribed the fall of Satan to his own son? Do you think he takes it lightly? If he would never forgive the scribes and Pharisees for saying that Christ performed miracles with the power of Satan, he said, these people shall never be forgiven because they have said this. Uh, do you think he takes it lightly when you uh, take the name of his son and ascribe it to the fall of Lucifer or Satan? Think about that for a while. Do you think God takes that lightly? We have forgotten. We are at the point as Christians today where we brush off sin. We don't take sin seriously as God does. It doesn't bother us. Oh, it's just, well, they decided to put the name of Christ in the fall of Satan. No, no big deal. No big deal. When God looked at those scribes and Pharisees, Christ himself says, you will never be forgiven for the sin. God takes it seriously, my brethren. So now, that was free, by the way, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. The last verse before we get into our message, I want to read that to you. For all that is in the world, John, 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Let's open up, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this message this morning. I know Father will talk about some things that may be unpleasant to hear, but Father, the church should not be, uh, they should always give, make us a little uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit should bring joy in our hearts, and at the same time, He should uh, keep uh, uh, pruning us, weeding all the things that need to be weeded out from our lives, and, uh, and we should be doing this with joy. We should receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit with joy. The work in His heart, the, uh, His work in our hearts, may we receive it with gladness. That God is teaching us these things, that God is opening our eyes, our hearts, our minds, to receive what you have for us, Lord God, and help us rejoice when, the, when you are working on our hearts. And I pray this morning, work in the hearts of your people, Lord God, in this great sin of pride. And we pray, Lord God, that we take it to heart, that we don't get upset about it, that we receive uh, your admonition, Lord God, that we may be better Christians for you. We thank you, God, for this time. We pray you bless the message. I pray you give us open hearts and open minds this morning to receive your word and do a work in us, in all of us, in your people, a work that only you can do, Father. And we will be sure to thank you and to be glad for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's obvious this morning I'm going to preach on the sin of pride and then at the end we'll end up with, uh, with what is the opposite of pride and that's humility. The only way you can fix pride in your life is if you become humble. So, but if, I, if you were to ask me, if I were to ask you, what is pride? What definition would you come up with pride? Well, pride is... It's an attitude. It's, it's an attitude of the heart which expresses itself in an unhealthy and exaggerated view of one's self-importance. And when you elevate yourself, uh, when you elevate your abilities, your accomplishments, your position and, pos and possessions above someone else. 
More subtly, the sin of pride manifests in the excessive preoccupation of yourself and your life. Who do you live for? Do you live for others? Do you live for God? Or do you live for you? Now, the Bible doesn't teach we have to abrogate our daily responsibilities, that we have to uh, not support our families, because the Bible says if you do so, you're an infidel. But when you are preoccupied with yourself, you are dealing with the sin of pride in your heart. Pride is the opposite of humility, and pride, according to God, is rebellion. That's why we, when we talk about pride, we always have to talk about Satan, Lucifer, because it was pride, the pride that was in his heart, that caused him to fall. And when you're proud, you place the honor, the honor and glory due to God upon your own self. And God hates that because the Bible is clear. God will not share his glory with anyone else. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. Charles Spurgeon described pride as an all-pervading sin. He said this, pride is so natural to the fallen man that springs up in his heart like weeds in a well-watered garden. Its every touch is evil. You may hunt down this fox and think you have destroyed it, and lo, your very exaltation is pride. He had a way with words. None have more pride than those who dream that they have none. Pride is a sin with a thousand lives. It seems impossible to kill it. Did you hear what the proud Christian said? I am not proud. I know I am humble. Some of you may get that. Uh, David Roth said, Pride is the dandelion of the soul. Its roots goes deep, only a little left behind, and it sprouts again. Its seeds lodge in the tiniest encouraging cracks, and it flourishes in good soil. The danger of pride is that it feeds on goodness. The danger in pride is that it feeds on goodness. You don't have to be an evil person to be proud. You can be proud of the fact that you are good. And right there, you just blew it. Oh, I'm a good person. I'm a good Christian. John Stott said, Pride is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. The problem with pride, it's all about self. Self-exaltation, self-importance, self-sufficiency. And all these things take the place of God in your heart. You've heard people say, I'm a self-made man. You heard that? That's pride. Uh, you didn't do anything if God did not allow you to do it. Now, God does not mean that you don't work hard. Paul said that uh, he was placed in a ministry because he felt he was found faithful. And Paul testifies that he worked more abundantly than the rest of the apostles. But then he says, I did not do this, but the grace of God that was in me. So God works with us hand in hand. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Charity suffereth long, <clears throat> is kind, charity, charity envieth not, charity, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So one of the things to help you tame the pride in your heart is what? Is love. We find in the scripture that love is the remedy for all things. Last week we preached on fear. And we said, what is the greatest remedy uh, for fear in your life? If you are afraid of things, if you fear things, now we made the distinction between natural fears and unnatural fears. Uh, God will not take away the fear of uh, rattlesnakes in my heart. God will not take the fear of playing in, in the highway. These are natural fears, and God has placed them in us for self-preservation. But when we are talking about unnatural fears, the only way to cast out those unnatural fears, the Bible says, if you have been made perfect in love, and likewise, the Bible says, if you uh, want pride to be a base in your heart, then you have to fill it with love. Paul tells us that if you're full of love, you will not be full of yourself. We mentioned in one of our text verses that God mentions six things that he hates. Seven are an abomination unto him. What, what are these things? A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running to evil, a false witness. Uh, you guys are going to become lawyers, you're going to see a lot of false, bearing false witness. That is an abomination unto God. Uh, and then finally, he who sows discord among the brethren. Uh, sometimes if you disagree with someone, do not do sow discord. If you, can, if you go to a church and you don't like what the pastor is doing or whoever is doing, pray to God and go to another church. Don't create discord. God hates it. What is an abomination? These, are, these seven things God says are an abomination. 
Uh, an abomination is something that God despises. He hates intensely. He utterly hates these things. And the first thing on the list is what? A proud look. It's pride. Today we may uh, describe a proud person as someone who struts their stuff, has a swagger in his step. Why, do you, why does he have a swagger in his step? Because he's proud. And he thinks his stool does not stink. Some of you will get that. When he can't get his way, what does he often do? He says, do you know who I am? You heard, have you met people like that? Mm -hmm. They think their position, can, they can throw the weight around. Do you know who I am? That's pride. That's pride. It was a funny story. Um, it goes like this. It was a U.S. aircraft carrier that was on maneuvers, and uh, it was in the middle of the night, and as they were uh, traveling through the, through the waters, they noticed a, a light in the distance. It was a especially dark and foggy night, and after noting the coordinates, the captain recognized his ship was on a collision course with what he had deemed to be another ship in the distance. So he radioed ahead and he said, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. The response was, uh, we recommend that you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The captain insisted, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Again, he received a similar response from the other side. No, I say to you, you divert your course. The captain was now frustrated and he says, this is in a, in a stern voice. He says, this is the aircraft carrier, uh, the USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest ship in the U.S. Uh, fleet, the Atlantic fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. The response came back and says, uh, this is a lighthouse, uh, your call. Uh, when, I always found that story funny because sometimes when you think you are too big for your britches, someone else bigger than you is going to come along. <clears throat> that's, that's life. That's life. And as I mentioned in the, morning, in the beginning of our lesson, when we talk about pride, we have to talk about the devil. Lucifer fell because of his pride. In Ezekiel chapter 28, it describes this fall. God says, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy the oak covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. So Ezekiel chapter 28 is a prophecy regarding the king of Tyrus, but it's a veiled prophecy describing the fall of this covering cherub, who we know is Lucifer. And in verse 17, the prophecy continues and says, Thine heart was lifted up. You see that? His heart was lifted up. Why? Because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. When you study the description of Lucifer in the Bible, he was, a, he was not an angel. He was a cherub. He had four faces. He was covered in musical instruments. He was, he was covered in precious stones. He was glittering. He was bright. Uh, light uh, shone off of him. The light of God shone off of him. And he was beautiful. We may not think of uh, someone who has four faces as being beautiful, but the Bible says he was beautiful, a beautiful creature. The, the reason why he fell here tells us, thine heart was lifted up. Why? Because he thought he was, he knew he was beautiful and it got to him. He was wise, he was beautiful, he was perfect, he was a musical instrument. Uh, that's why music is so important. The, the uh, Lucifer was created by God for what? Not only to cover the throne of God, but to create music. To create music. He was the cherub of music. And the sin of pride is a sin of all sins. Uh, Satan takes great delight in those who exalt themselves because he has set the precedent of this attitude. In, in, in its basic uh, form, those who reject Christ do so because of pride. They are not willing to submit to Christ. And it's also pride that keeps the Christian from performing and fulfilling the will of God in their lives. Whenever you put yourself above God, that is pride. It was pride that was the cause of Lucifer's fall. He wanted to be God. 
And if you look at Isaiah chapter 14 and 13 again, you will see the five I wills. We call these the five I wills of Lucifer. He said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. Did you get that? God gave him a throne. What throne did he give him? He was in charge of all the hosts of heaven. He was God's number two man. So he had his throne. And he said, that was not enough. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So pride in its basic form means that you are becoming God. You are replacing God in your life. Pride was the reason why Satan was expelled from heaven. And don't let the reason, don't let it be the reason why you do not, do not enter heaven. When you preach the gospel to someone and they refuse it, the basic the reason why they refuse it is because of the pride of their heart. Because they refuse to submit. They refuse to admit that they are in need of a Savior. And I believe of, of all sins, God hates pride the most. As Christians, we look at the one who is committing adultery, who is committing fornication, who, uh, who is uh, uh, the murderers, the, the harlots, the drug addicts, uh, the thieves. We look at these sins and we say, oh, I don't do these things. These people are horrible. But you have something worse than what they're doing. You have pride in your heart. And God deems that sin more serious, more uh, worse than the other sins. The sin of pride is a preoccupation with self. It's all about me, myself, and I. You've heard that? Mm -hmm. It's about me, myself, and I. Pride does not want God. Pride wants what it wants. Isn't it ironic today that sexual perversion is celebrated by the word pride? You find that ironic? Pride is the mark of Satan. He is their king. They don't realize that. What does Job 41, uh, 34 say? He is a king over all what? All the children of pride. The co-founder of the satan satanic temple said this. He admitted that more than half of their members are LGBTQs and whatever else they have. Every year they kind of add a letter to that. He also said that our chapters are always involved with pride parades in the United States. Why? Because their father, their king, is the devil. And the Bible says he is the king over all the children of pride. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the work unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's why we are supposed to speak against these things. Oh, you're being insensitive. I don't hate them, but I'm obligated by the command of God that I, according to Ephesians 5.11 and other verses in the Bible, that I'm supposed to reprove these works of darkness. So whenever I get an opportunity, I say, this is wrong, this is perversion, this is ungodly. And they want you to accept them as they are. Well, I love you, I believe that Christ died for you, but if you do not turn from your sin and turn to Christ, you're going to end up in hell. God hates your sin. Pride is cited among some of the most glaring sins in the Bible. Romans 1.30, in Romans 1.30, Paul describes unrighteous people who will incur the wrath of God. He says, backbiters, haters of God, deceitful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, and on and on he goes. The Pharisees and uh, other Jewish leaders were some of the most prideful people in the, in the day of Christ. They were, rebuked, they were rebuked by Jesus for how they mistreated and spoke down to those who were beneath their social status or who they deemed to be inferior to them. In Matthew 23, 6-12, I'm not going to read the whole passage to you. Jesus says about them, They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and chief seats at the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi. And whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Now, pride, pride caused the fall of King Uzziah. He started off well, but he became so proud of his success, which was because of God, because at the beginning of his of his uh, reign, he followed God in his heart. But towards the end, he became proud. And he decided that he was going to go into the temple, into the tabernacle, and uh, <clears throat> to the temple and burn incense on the altar of incense. And as soon as he did that, what did God do to him? He struck him with leprosy as punishment for his pride. 
Remember Hezekiah? He cried unto the Lord. The Lord said, you will die, Hezekiah. Get your affairs in order. And Hezekiah turned on his bed and he weep, wept before the Lord. And he, he says, God, you've seen how good I have been. You've seen how I've, my heart has been toward you. And God says, okay, Hezekiah, I will give you 15 years. But what happened to Hezekiah during those 15 years? He produced an heir, Manasseh. He became proud in his heart. When the Babylonians came and they saw all that he had, he showed them all that he had. He was lifted up in pride. And because of that, he sowed the seed of Judah's captivity. <clears throat> King Herod, remember him? When the people were worshiping him and he gave an oration and they said, oh, this is, the Mount, this is God who is speaking. What did God do to him? The Bible says he struck him down instantly and worms inside his body ate him up and he died. Of the prince of Tyrus, we looked at briefly in Ezekiel uh, chapter 28. The Lord says of him now, uh, the king of Tyrus is none other than Satan. It's a prophecy regarding Satan. And God calls him the king of Tyrus. There's a lot of names God gives Satan. And king, uh, prince, sorry, uh, prince of Tyrus is one of them. And he says, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. But God says to him, Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. That's a prophecy regarding the Antichrist, who will come and sit in the, in the temple and proclaim that he is God. Look at King Solomon, said this in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. If you have pride in your heart, and you let it fester, the end of that is destruction. In the Bible, a pride not only caused the ruin of individual but also nations. Israel fell because of their pride. They forgot God. Ultimately, it was a sin of pride that caused the people of Israel to Judah to be cut off from the promised land of Canaan. Why? Because pride will keep you from God. Remember what we said about pride. It replaces God with self. You don't listen to God. You don't obey God. You refuse to submit to God. That's pride. James 4, 6 tells us that God opposes the proud, but give grace gives grace to the humble. And the Bible it tells us in the last days, likewise, pride will be one of the prevailing sins in society. In 2 Timothy 3, 2-4, Paul says this, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do you see that? Lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. In this list right there, you see five or six words that are associated with pride. People who love God and godliness reject pride. And I believe if you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you're called by the name of God, deep down inside your heart, the Holy Spirit wants you to reject the pride in your heart. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. Do you know how you, you do you know one of the ways that you're getting closer to God, that you're growing spiritual, uh, you're growing spiritually, and you're maturing as a Christian is when you begin to loathe and hate sin as God does. You will see sin as God sees it, and you will despise it. Now you've got to be careful that you don't become a Pharisee. That's a fine line you draw between holy and righteous indignation and being a Pharisee. Bible warns people not to elevate themselves because the pride of sin will come into your heart. Sometimes God gives you abilities and talents and you have to recognize that. And you cannot say, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that people, that smart people fall into is they think they're smart because of that. You're smart because your DNA made you smart. Because God gave you those smarts so that you, so that you can use them for your glory. Uh, you, God may not has give, may, God may not have given you the intelligence of your neighbor or the next person next to you or your friend. Why? It's not because God hated you. When God gives you a certain ability or talent, He expects you to use it for His glory and for His honor. Some people are stronger than others. Some people are, are uh, more socially uh, adapt than others. More people have the gift of oration, the gift of speaking. We all have gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us. And God expects you to use these gifts for His glory and for His honor. And you should never fall into the trap of thinking, Oh, look at me, I'm smart. You can never say that. 
How do you compare with the intelligence of God? You're like an amoeba in a petri dish if you do that. One way to determine whether the sin of pride is festering in your heart is to meditate on what preoccupies your attention. What do you think about most of the time? Do you think about God? What, why do you do what you do? And, and I want to switch gears now, and I wanna, I'm going to continue preaching on pride, but I want to preach on the subtlety of pride. The danger of pride is that most people are unaware that they're proud. They don't see it. Obadiah 1.3 says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Paul Powell once observed, Pride is so subtle that if we aren't careful, we'll be proud of our humility. You get that? If you're not careful, you'll be proud of your humility. When this happens, our goodness becomes badness. Our virtues become vices. We can easily become like the Sunday school teacher who, having told the story of the Pharisee and the publican, said, All right, children, let's bow our heads and thank God that we are not like the Pharisees. Pride is perilously deceptive. Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Pride gives way to conflicts and quarreling. One of the things that I want to... Uh, we've taught about this in Proverbs 13.10. If there's conflict in your marriage, if there's fighting in your marriage, the, the root of that is pride. Mm -hmm. Because you want your way. You want to be right. Uh, you don't care about the other person, what they have to say. It's your way or the highway. And that's not how it is. Your way may be the wrong way. If your way is, if your way is the right way, then in humility you have to uh, show the other person your way. When the Bible talks about pastors and they have to be... Uh, they have to be uh, apt to teach, he tells them to do that gently, not harshly. Pride adversely affects one's speech. Malachi 3.13 says, Your words have been stout against me, says the Lord. Stout means bold, uh, perhaps irreverent. People do not think they need to ask God for forgiveness because they can't admit or recognize their sinful condition. And that's why people can't, can't get saved today. The pride of their hearts. As a result, pride often affects your condition or attitude towards others, causing you to look down upon others who are less worthy or less able than you are. Prideful people treat others with contempt and cruelty. Pride is at the heart of prejudice. In Proverbs 21, 23, proud and haughty scorner is his name. God tells you that if you are proud, your name is pride and haughty. The greatest danger in the sin of pride is that it keeps our eyes on ourselves instead of God. In essence, pride causes spiritual blindness and eventually spiritual death. Why? Because pride t tells you that I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. But what does humility say? You've got to go to God continually. Watch me, watch me knee, and I, I like his writings. He said, often Satan injects pride into the believer's spirit, evoking in him an attitude of self-importance and of self-conceit who causes him to esteem himself a very outstanding person and one who is indispensable in God's work. Such a spirit constitutes one of the major reasons for the fall of believers. I'm going to save the world on my own. I am the greatest Bible teacher in the world. I'm the greatest pastor in the world. I'm the greatest preacher in the world. I'm the greatest evangelist in the world. I'm the greatest wife in the world. I'm the greatest, and so on and so on and so on you can go. And who does that in your heart? Satan takes your abilities and your talents that God has given you. And he knows that through those things you can lift up your pride. And then, and then before you know it, you have fallen into his trap. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was keenly aware of the dangers of pride. And he says one day, uh, one Sunday morning as he preached his message, and he was done, a woman came to him and exclaimed, Oh, Mr. Spurgeon, that was wonderful. Yes, Madam Spurgeon replied, So did the devil whisper in my ear, as it came down the steps from the pulpit. He rebuked that woman. Well, he didn't rebuke her, but he reminded her that I have to be careful that I don't be lifted up in pride. Spurgeon had it right. Uh, genuine compliments are not sin. It's not wrong to compliment someone. But when you get a compliment from someone else, you have to recognize the source of the compliment and why are you being complimented. Many times I've heard people say, oh, that was a great message. I say, thank you, uh, but, me, but be sure to thank the Lord. 
because it comes from the Lord. Your talents, who do they come from? Your abilities, who do they come from? They don't come from you. God, they come from God. If God has made you gifted in a certain area, you may be musically talented. I am musically declined. Uh, but when I, so therefore, I admire the talent of music in someone else. And I know that's a God-given talent because I don't have it. And I don't begrudge it. It makes me appreciate that talent more than others who have it. God has made you intelligent. Why? Because He wants to use your mind for His glory. Yeah. It's a shame. I was talking with someone just a week ago. And it's a shame that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of people who teach the Scripture and they're not equipped to do so. They don't know so. They haven't studied all the doctrines. They're too lazy. It's a shame. The Bible makes it clear that if you're a pastor of a church, you have to be apt to teach. It's one of the qualifications. When you assume you already know something, I'm going to give you some things here to help you to see. Uh, I'm not, you're probably hearing this message. and I'm just kidding now. I'm just going to kid with you a little bit. Oh man, this is a good message. Uh, I'm glad I'm not proud. I want to give you some things to see if you're proud or not. And I guarantee all of us will fall into this category. Probably one or more of, this thing, of these things. When you assume you already know something when someone else is teaching, that's pride. I was like that when I was a kid. I would rebut the teachers all the time. <clears throat> I was a proudful little kid because God had given me certain abilities and I would see the teacher and say, that's wrong, miss. That was pride. When you think you are beyond performing certain tasks, that's pride. When you need help and refuse to ask for help, that's pride. When you dominate the conversation and talk about yourself, that's pride. Have you ever met those people? You can't say a word in edgewise. It's all about them. They dominate the conversation. That's pride. When you're constantly critical, that's pride. When you're unable to receive constructive criticism, that's pride. When you're obsessed with your physical appearance, that's pride. I use the word obsessed. The Bible makes it clear. He does, God does not want us to go out there uh, being disheveled. He says, anoint your face with oil when you're fasting, but others may not see that you're fasting. The Bible condemns the sin of gluttony. You've got to be careful. You see, when you are obsessed with your physical appearance, that's pride. It doesn't mean you don't comb your hair in the morning. When you're unwilling to submit to authority, that's pride. I've met a lot of people in my life. They can't submit, submit to pastoral authority. They just can't do it. When you name drop in order to associate yourself with people uh, who have prominent position, that's pride. Pride is deceptive and so subtle it can sneak in your life in many different ways. So at this point you may say, you've convinced me, I'm proud. How do I fight pride? I'm glad you asked. When you think yourself to be a humble individual, you've blown it. But the more we walk in Christ, the more you and I walk in Christ, the more He will show us the pride in our heart. And, and, and God wants to show the pride in our heart. Why? Because He wants us to be more like His Son. God wants you to be humble. So do you not think that God will show what, what thing in your heart is causing you to be proud that you may not even know it? And don't think you and I are beyond pride. pride. None of us are beyond this sin. It may surprise you to know that there are many ways that pride can creep into your life. And I want to caution all of us that we must be on guard against these things. I think by now you should be, you should be convinced that God hates pride. Only when the Holy Spirit comes into your heart can pride be pushed out of it. The Moody said, I believe that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride, selfishness, and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. In Colossians 3.12, Paul says, Put on, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and unbeloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Paul describes humility and all these good traits as something that you put on like a garment. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Humility is the opposite of pride, but humility does not come naturally. Pride comes naturally because it's part of a fallen nature. Humility is something that we must put on. It's something that we become. It requires active participation. You have to work 
on being humble. It's easier to point out the proud, but can you think of someone who is humble? We look around in our society, in, our, in, in all walks of life, in our uh, interactions with our co-workers, our politicians, those around us, and we say, oh, he's proud, he's proud, she's proud. But can you point out to somebody who says, oh, he's humble, she's humble? Can you do that? It's easier to think of people who embody pride and arrogance than those who embody humility. If humility was a wardrobe, then most of us would be scantily clad. C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, which is a danger. Now, many times, a lot, I've been in a lot of churches when pastors that preach, and they preach messages that are self-deprecating. That is not biblical, my friends. You are a child of the king. You are a son of God. There's nothing to be self-deprecating. That, that is not self-deprecating. That is a position of honor. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility recognizes who I am in the light of God. Humility sees me as God sees me. And humility in the scriptures is often associated with brokenness. In Psalms 51, 17, uh, Psalms 51 is one of the greatest psalms in the scriptures. David wrote it after his sin with Bathsheba. He was greatly broken over the sin. And he says in Psalms 51, 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Brokenness is the state of complete humility. It is the heart that says, I am nothing, O God, but you are everything. God cannot turn away a heart as such. Humility invites the grace of God into one's life. Humility is a, is a Christian virtue. A, a heart of humility desires to serve even in obscurity. And if you ponder the humility of Christ, your attitude on humility will change greatly. Uh, the Bible says about Christ that in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. What was the mind of Christ? And Paul tells us, who being in the form of God, thought of not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Christ was born in humble beginnings, in poverty. And the Bible says he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of a, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The very act that God was willing to leave heaven and to leave all his glory behind was an act of humility. And he came to live as a man and to die a horrible death on the cross for you and I. Through the life of Christ, you will know that he exemplified humility. Humility. He came, he says, not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. Remember, on his last night before he was to be crucified, what did he do? He actually took a basin and he filled it with water. And he took a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. That was a great act of humility because back in the Bible days, that was your servant that did that. Every time you walked through the doors of someone's house, your, house would, your, your feet were dusty. They had a, a pitcher of water and a bowl there with rags and towels. And then the servant would come and you take off your sandals or your shoes or your whatever you were wearing, your running shoes, uh, your flip-flops. And they would take the towels and they would clean your feet. That was the job of the servant. But Jesus Christ did that to his disciples to show that he was humble. In Matthew 12, 20, we are told, A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. That was the uh, ministry of Christ. This is how he treated people. He didn't treat them harshly. He wasn't arrogant toward them. He was gentle and meek and compassionate toward them and humble toward them. The only people that Christ berated was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when I was younger, I would be in circles and I would hear uh, pastors and, and preachers, they would preach, they would berate the children of God. Oh, you good for nothing, dirtball, animated, whatever. And they would come with a laundry list of adjectives to make you feel good, to make you feel like you're worthless. That is not true, my brother. You are of high value in the sight of God. Christ never did that to the people. He never berated them. He was gentle towards them. He was compassionate towards them. He loved them. The only people that he was harsh with was the Pharisees and the scribes and the, Sa and the Sadducees and the lawyers. Why? Because they knew better. They knew better. And God invites the humble into his presence. In Isaiah 57, 15, he says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. I love how God describes himself. 
He calls himself, he's the only one that can brag on himself because he's God. The high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. And I love this part. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. This is the paradox of humility. You can only become more humble as you walk closely with the Savior. And as you walk closely with the Savior, the Savior will make you more humble. In Isaiah 62, 66-2 says, For all those things hath my hand made, and those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and tremble about my word. Would those be the words that God would use to describe you? Would God look upon you from heaven and say, I'm going to dwell with him. My presence is going to be mighty with him or her, with this child, with this daughter, with this son. Because they are of a contrite spirit. Because they're deeply broken inside. And they tremble at my word. And if you and I do not humble ourselves, God will use life to do that for us. Horses, they say, are powerful animals. And they must be broken, though. You must break a horse for them to obey their master. They never lose their strength, but when broken, their strength is now controlled under the reins of their owner, ruler, or master. A humility, though, as I end this message, will be done very quickly. I want to point out the fact that when you're humble, it doesn't mean that you're a doormat. It doesn't mean that you allow people to walk all over you. Instead, it's an understanding that every human being is equally valuable. That when you look at your, the people around you, you don't think that you're better than them. And you don't think that you're less valuable than them either. You recognize that Christ died for them just as much as he died for you. And as Christians, we have to compare ourselves to Christ alone. Uh, don't ever get into the habit or into the trap of comparing yourself to someone else. That's from the devil. You never compare yourself to someone else. The only, re the only thing you need to do is look toward others who are following Christ and, and, they, and they have to be an encouragement to you. Nothing more, nothing less. When I realize that Christ is much better than me, that he is much higher than me, I mean, he is much more than me, and then I recognize and I hear and understand from the scriptures that he who is so much high, who is lofty, who inhabiteth eternity, humbled himself and took on the form of a man. If he did that, then I can do that too. It means I can humble myself. I can sacrifice self, submit to the Savior, and seek to succor the saints. I push pride away and clothe myself with a wardrobe of humility and always look to the Savior. I don't do this once. I don't do this once in a while. I'll do, I do this every day. I should do this every day. We should do this every day. Clothe ourselves with humility. May you and I follow the example of Christ, interacting as he did, loving as he did, and dying to self as he did. May we push the sin of pride away from our lives and clothe ourselves with humility of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this message. Uh, Lord, a pride is a sin that we know from scriptures that you hate so much. But you do not leave us hanging. You do not leave us wallowing in the sin of pride, but you want us to humble ourselves. You want us to allow you, Lord God, to push pride away from our hearts. And I pray, Lord God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we strive to be more humble before you. May we strive to be Christ-like. Thank you, God, for this message. Thank you, Lord God, that you tell us that none of us are beyond pride. And we understand, Father, through the Scriptures, that pride is a subtle sin that can creep unawares in our hearts. May we not let that happen. 